All right, welcome to our study on the feast days in Revelation. This is part one of the summer festivals. The book of Revelation has been and remains a mystery to many Bible students. My first encounter with it was fear, mostly from people who were just saying things that they heard. However, I purchased two books that changed my thinking entirely. One was Josephus, and the other was the book of Revelation commentary by 4E Wallace Jr., now, the next significant books that I studied were The Spirit of Prophecy by Max R. King and Who is This Babylon by Don K. Preston, Doctor of Divinity, both of whom are full preterists. Now, since that time, it's been on and off, stop and go, and a lot of stopping and not much going. However, having been introduced to the feast days in 1995 at the Oklahoma City Lectures uh, by the late Bill Kennengeiser, I have studied them off and on for the past 25 years. Uh, the next significant discovery was a paper written by John Paulian that uh, presented the book of Revelation outlined according to God's festal calendar. Now, coupled with the knowledge that I had, I began to see Revelation is primarily temple imagery and arranged according to the Hebraic festal calendar. This imagery only makes sense in a temple cultic background of an existing priesthood and people familiar with those customs and culture. The book will fit no other audience or time period in history than those who lived in the culture from an ideal point of view. You just can't find another audience than the audience which existed in the first century in order to um, align the events of the book of Revelation when you talk about the temple background culture and the feast days. Only one generation uh, would have understood that, and that would have been the first century generation for the most part. Now, the Passover in Revelation. The Passover was the first of God's festivals. While it is admitted that there are allusions to the Passover in Revelation, it is denied that this is a strong emphasis, or that there is a strong emphasis in the book. But before we address that issue, let us note some key elements in the Passover uh, comparison with Revelation. When we look at the Exodus and we talk about the Passover, you have the Passover starting in the beginning of Israel's festal year or of their agricultural year, which was the um, first month. And the Passover was to be uh, taken, or the Passover lamb was to be uh, put up on the 10th day of the month. Each household was to take a lamb without blemish, a male of the first year. They were to keep it until the 14th of the month, and all the congregation would kill it. Uh, they also were to eat it at twilight, roasted on fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Sprinkle, uh, they were to sprinkle the blood to avoid destruction when Egypt was destroyed and to remove all the leaven, uh, verse 15, from their houses. Uh, this was considered as a holy congregation. Uh, convocation and Sabbath, and they were to observe it forever. Now, when we look in the book of Revelation at the uh, Passover, uh, we have Revelation 1 and verse 5 that speaks of Christ having uh, loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And so there's an allusion to the Passover, a direct reference as far as I'm concerned, uh, because once again, it says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So the first thing that we have is that he is the firstborn from the dead. And we also have the statement that he loved us and he washed us from our sins in his own blood. And that would suggest, of course, that he is the Passover lamb. Now, another point in Revelation chapter 1, which to me would suggest that, remember, when we looked at the illustration, it says that all the congregation would kill him and, or kill the, um, yes, uh, in terms of the Passover. And in verse 7 of Revelation 1, it says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. And you know, if we know that it was the entire nation of Israel who shouted out, crucify him, crucify him. So uh, 
they were the ones responsible for the crucifixion of Christ. Then we have a lamb slain who redeemed them in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9, another reference to uh, a Passover or the Passover. It says, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So there you have it once again, uh, the emphasis on the Passover. Now, uh, another thing that they were to do uh, at the time of the Passover, as we look from and notice from Exodus 12, is that they were to remove all the leaven from the houses. Now, it's interesting in the way that the book of Revelation is set up. We have Jesus, who is among the candlesticks, among the seven churches, and what he is doing is he's searching for leaven, if you please, in the house. And of course, he finds some within several of the congregations. Uh, when we go back, uh, let's go, I think I lost the slide here. But if you look at Jeremiah 17, well, first of all, even before then, you go to Revelation 2 and the verses 23, he says, I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now, the Bible says that every thought and intent of the imagination of the heart is known by God. And therefore, he's able to search the hearts to remove the leaven. And we'll say a little bit more about that as we go on. Jeremiah 17 and 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Romans 8, 27 says, now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And then Revelation 3 and verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. Uh, I believe while this is a reference to the Messianic banquet, I think it also fulfills the concept of the Passover and um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread uh, in terms of the Messianic banquet. But let's go on and see how we will develop this. Now, there are some objections to the concept that the Passover is being spoken of in the first uh, verses of the book of Revelation or in the first few chapters of, of the Re book of Revelation. Samuel Bacciochi, I guess I'm pronouncing that correctly. It could be Bacciochi, but I think it's Bacciochi. In God's Festival in Scripture and History, Part 2, the festivals, the fall festivals, page 93, raises several objections. He says there are no, or, or that no reference is made to the Christ as lamb or to the elements of a Paschal meal. There is no reference to Christ as a lamb in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. But it is a clear declaration of the Passover. John made references, but did not speak of a Paschal meal in John 1 and 29. So what do those verses say? In 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, the text says, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. But we have no mention of a lamb in that text, yet it is the Passover. And then in John 1 and verse 29, John says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Obviously, another reference to the Passover, but no reference to a Paschal meal. So the objection raised by Samuel Bacciochi, I don't think uh, really uh, answers the question. The fact that there are no references to the elements does not mean that they are not implied in the term Passover, and uh, all Israel was aware of this. Number two, instead, he says Christ is referred to as the Son of Man, a term associated with heavenly judgment, Daniel 7, 13, and 14. Now, we don't deny that, um, uh, excuse me, that the Son of Man is a reference to uh, the time of judgment. Christ is also referred to as judge in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 5. Let's go there and take a look at it, and this is in the context where we just mentioned that Christ was the Passover. But we also see that he is um, occupying a dual role of judge as well, because the scripture says in the name, and actually that should be verse four, 
But it says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, destroy such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Well, there is a reference to the day, the judgment. And yet in that very context, he talks about the, uh, that Christ is our Passover. So you don't find a mutually exclusive situation where just because you're talking about judgment, you cannot be talking about Passover. And Christ, therefore, is referred to as the judge in 1 Corinthians. And we also see in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 13, where the judgment of Egypt is mentioned in the same context with the Passover. So from the very institution of Passover, we have judgment and Passover in the very same context. They are interrelated. We'll see that more as we move forward. Now, the imagery of Christ to dine is not collective communion, but individual. He cited the passage from Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21. Uh, Bacciochi says this is an individual um, invitation because he says, Behold, I stand at the door. And knock, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Well, if you look at the text carefully, uh, when it says, if anyone, he stands at the door. Now, when you knock on a door, do you automatically know how many people are standing behind that door? Or, or does that, let me ask it another way. Does that actually mean that only one person is in the house? No, that doesn't mean that people knock on our door every single day or not every day, but you know on a routine basis, and uh, all of my family is in the house. So just because you knock on the door doesn't mean that there's only one person there. Uh, in addition, he says, if anyone hears my voice, and so by the use of the term anyone, that would mean anyone who is there. And it just doesn't mean if uh, 10 people in the house, only one is going to respond, all 10 of them could respond. And so I don't think that argument is very solid. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Uh, in the case where there were not enough family members per household, they would invite enough members to complete the number around 10. And that could be one or more, depending on how many people were lacking to celebrate the Passover. First Corinthians 5 and verse 7 was yet occurring. So they were yet observing the Passover when the book of Revelation was written. Because if the Bible tells you in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, for Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us, and then the next verse says, let us keep the feast with unleavened bread, then we should understand that during this interim period, not just at the death of Jesus Christ, that the Passover was yet being uh, observed. Now, Christ's intense scrutiny of the churches can hardly be associated with the search for leaven in the Jewish household because the latter took place before Passover, while Revelation 1 through 3 presents Jesus' death and resurrection in the past. Now, he's making, you know, basically that argument again that we looked at on Passover and judgment. And so now he's making it on the removal of leaven from the houses. And so his argument is that, you know, Christ's Intense scrutiny, which we pointed out earlier, was the removal of leaven and therefore a, a Passover reference. So he's, uh, Bacciochi is saying that Christ's intense scrutiny of the churches can hardly be associated with the search for leaven in the Jewish household because the latter took place before Passover, while Revelation 1 3 presents Jesus' death and resurrection in the past. Now, since Revelation 1 5 says they were washed from their sins through the blood of Christ the leaven would have already been removed. We can see that they've been washed from their sins, but the concept of removing the sins of Israel was a progressive thing. We have that indicated in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, where the text says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. But you also have in Ephesians 1 verses 13 and 14 that it was through the power of the Spirit, through the earnest of the Spirit, that was given to the saints until the retire, excuse me, until the uh, redemption of the purchased possession. 
and the uh, purchased possession was not redeemed fully at the time of Christ. Otherwise, they would have, at the death of Christ, otherwise the spirit would have been poured out at the death of Christ. But that couldn't be because according to John 7, 37 through 39, the Bible says when Jesus spoke of out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, he says, but this he spoke concerning the spirit, um, which would be given to them, to those who believe on him, uh, but it was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus wasn't glorified until he was raised from the dead. And that's what the Bible says. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? So the sufferings were first, 1 Peter chapter 1, 10, 12, and then the glories that would follow. So from that uh, perspective, we have the redemption of the purchased possession uh, in the future. He says, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee or the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, the Bible says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. And so the Holy Spirit, as long as that ministry continued, the eschatological spirit was poured out in the last days, then the day of redemption was future. And that's why in Luke 21, 28, the Bible says, and when you see these things begin to come to pass, speaking of those events surrounding the destruction of the city and the temple, he says, look up, lift up your heads for your redemption has drawn near. So it wasn't completed at the death of Christ. But let's go on and look at another point. Um, as in 1 Corinthians 5, 8, they were to continue to keep the feast. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This is the text, again, where the Bible says, for even Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Okay, well, if Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us, the Bible says in uh, verse 7, therefore, purge out the old leaven. Now notice, in this context, this is after Jesus has died, the church in Corinth is told to purge out leaven. So they were yet purging out leaven in this case. And he says that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Now watch verse 8. Now, yes, he says they are unleavened, but he says, therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so what they had to do was to purge out the leaven that had risen up among the congregation in order for them to be acceptable before God. And so um, the purging out of the old leaven after the Passover had been sacrificed is in harmony with New Testament teaching. Then objection number five, he says, um, the fusion of festival typologies. What militates against the exact sequential order of the annual feast in Revelation is also the fact that the typology of the feast often overlaps. Davidson recognizes this fact when he says, each succeeding section of Revelation must not be expected to have exclusive reference to the corresponding festival. He cites Revelation 7, 9 through 17. Notice now what he says, where both the Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles are indicated. So he's indicating here, he's admitting that the Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles are indicated in the same context, and therefore there is some overlapping of these festivals in the book of Revelation. Bacciochi answers this alleged problem in the introduction of his book. He says, when we come to the New Testament, the typical aspects of Passover are fulfilled Christologically and eschatologically. Christologically, the Passover was fulfilled at the cross when Christ our Paschal Lamb was sacrificed, and he cites 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, to deliver us from the bondage of sin. Then he says, eschatologically, Passover will be fulfilled at the establishment of God's kingdom when the redeemed will be invited to participate at the marriage supper of the Lamb, Revelation 19 and verse 9. Well, that's why we pointed out 
in Revelation 3 and verse 21 that it was the Messianic banquet. So he's admitting that the Passover has an eschatological uh, fulfillment and therefore overlaps with other feasts. In addition to that, um, he is citing the um, uh, Messianic banquet in Revelation 19.9, which is a parallel to Revelation 3 and verse 21. Now, Christ himself pointed to this future fulfillment of the Passover when he said, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I tell you, I shall not eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God, Luke 22 and verse 16. So notice, Christ said he was not going to eat the Passover until it was fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And in this statement, Christ makes it clear that the ultimate fulfillment of Passover will be at the end, that is the time of the end, with the establishment of God's kingdom, to be eaten in the Father's kingdom at the time of the end. Now, commenting on the eschatological element of biblical typology, Bacciochi cites Davidson that biblical eschatology may have three kinds of fulfillment. Number one is inaugurated, connected with the first advent of Christ. Number two is appropriated, focused on the church as she lives in tension between the already but the not yet. And three, consummated, uh, linked to the apocalyptic second coming of Christ. These three possible kinds of eschatological fulfillments of biblical typology in general apply to a large extent to the festival, uh, festival typology. In particular, for example, we found that the Christian Passover has an inaugurated eschatological fulfillment since it looks back to what has already happened. It is a proclamation of the death of Jesus Christ. So it's looking back to the time of the Passover. But watch, it also has an appropriated eschatological fulfillment since it enables believers in the present to enter into fellowship with the exalted Lord at the Lord's table. Paul calls this fellowship as a participation in the blood and of the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16. But also notice that finally the Christian Passover will have a consummated fulfillment at the future Messianic banquet. Christ alluded to the consummated fulfillment of Passover when he said, I shall not drink of it again of the fruit of the, or drink of it again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Mark 14, 25. Uh, cross-reference Matthew 26, 29, Luke 22, 16, and 18. And even in the passage in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, 26, he says, you do proclaim the Lord's death, all right, that's focusing on the past, till he come. So right in the very verse, you have uh, the Passover and judgment uh, mentioned together. So Bacciochi tidies this up in his book in the following manner. The meaning of the Christian Passover is both commemorative and prefigurative, just like the Old Testament Passover. So he admits, as we said before, that the Exodus also had that backward look as well as that forward look. And on the, uh, on the one hand, it commemorates the past deliverance from the bondage of sin through Christ's suffering and death. On the other hand, it prefigures the future celebration of the marriage supper of the Lamb, Revelation 19.9, at the establishment of God's kingdom. Christ himself alluded to the eschatological fulfillment of Passover when he said to his disciples that he would not eat of this Passover again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God, Luke 22 and verse 16. The benefits of Christ's atoning death are mediated to believers in the present when they partake of the emblems of his blood and body. Now that present was the already but not yet. At the Lord's table, believers enter into the fellowship with the exalted Lord, Paul describes this fellowship as a participation in the blood and body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16. And so, in its true meaning, Passover was fused with the fall festivals in its forward-looking element, thus to find it connected with eschatological themes and overlapping with such feasts as Pentecost and Tabernacles is natural and scriptural. Bacciochi agrees, we have found that the Feast of Passover and Tabernacles, for example, were seen by the Jews not only as commemorative of their past deliverance and protection, but also as typical of future messianic redemption and restoration, page 27. Finally, in view of the time of consummation, when Christ will eat new with them in the kingdom of God at the messianic banquet, 
such meal was future and thus the need to continue to remove the leaven as noted in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 through 9. Now, let's talk about the typological nature of the feast. The deeper meaning of these annual feasts were veiled. They also had an annual present practical meaning to the Israelites. Without the typological meaning of the flood, the exodus, Moses, the sacrificial system, the Sabbath, and the annual feast, it would be nearly impossible uh, for us to realize their significance. Now, unleavened bread, this immediately followed the Passover so closely that they practically became one. Christ is the unleavened bread. He is the sinless one who is pure and holy, thus unleavened without sin, the truth and faithful. Now, the first fruits, which was the um, next of the uh, summer festivals, uh, so you have the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then you have the Feast of First Fruits, which was the time of the barley harvest. In Revelation 1, 17 and 18, the text says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. So here is the text speaking of Christ being the first and the last. And uh, in this, um, he's the firstborn from the dead as well. The, in Revelation 3 and verse 14, it says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And when he talks about the beginning of the creation of God, this is uh, directly parallel to Colossians 1, 15 and 18 where it's discussing the beginning of the new creation. Christ is the first fruits, the firstborn. And so Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, the firstborn out of uh, the death of sin, and uh, releasing others from Hades, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Now, then we have in chapter 4 of the book of Revelation a, an allusion to Pentecost. We have the um, throne scene, which is a manifestation of God in the temple, which is also uh, a character you would say, a depiction of Pentecost. Now, what we have when we look at Revelation chapter 4 is a door standing open in heaven. You hear a voice like a trumpet, and uh, that's Revelation 1.10, but you also have uh, this voice like a trumpet speaking with me in Revelation 4 and verse 1. The invitation to come up here, and uh, this is the ascension of the temple mount uh, in, in 4 and verse 1. Uh, God's throne was set in uh, the most holy place. Uh, the most holy place is in the uh, peak of the temple. Uh, whether you want to talk about the kingdom as a temple, the Garden of Eden as a temple, Mount Sinai as a temple, all of those represented cosmic mountains where God's throne was sitting at the very top of the mountain. And so there was an invitation to come up, to ascend to the temple mount. The throne was set in heaven, verse 2, and um, heaven was the place where God was. Uh, you find that in Exodus 20, verse 22 as well. Even in Mount Sinai, it said God spoke to them from heaven. But one sat on the throne like Jasper and a sardius stone. A rainbow was around the throne like an emerald. There were 24 elders around the throne. And from the throne proceeds lightnings, thunderings, and voices. These were the same types of cosmic disturbances and earthly disturbances that you saw at the Mount uh, at Mount Sinai when God made his appearance to them, which is understood as the time in which they were given uh, the law. And so uh, seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne and uh, Revelation 120. The throne was like a sea of glass, like crystal in the midst of the throne and around the throne were the four living creatures, like a lion, a calf, a man, and a flying eagle, and a constant refrain of holy, holy, holy. And so uh, from these uh, verses, uh, when you compare that with Exodus 19, you will see that God came to Moses in a thick cloud uh, in the hearing of the people to know so that they would know that God spoke with Moses. And the people were to prepare themselves that they would be able to meet 
uh, before uh, or in the presence of God who would come down in the sight of all the people. And when the trumpet sounded long, they would come near and uh, there would be thunderings, lightnings, a thick cloud on the mountain, a sound of a loud trumpet. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. The Lord descended on the mount in the fire uh, and smoke and quaking. And God spoke to them from heaven, Exodus 20, 22. Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and the 70 elders. They saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was a paved work of sapphire stone that the very heavens, uh, like the very heavens in clarity, those who were authorized to see God were not killed. God did not lay a hand on them. And then Moses went up to receive the tablets of stone. That is a revelation from God. So he ascended in the thick cloud with flaming fire and smoke where God was. And so what we have in Revelation 4 is God in uh, the temple and a reference to um, the feast, uh, feast of Pentecost from the perspective of the feast days being laid out in uh, Revelation. Now, I understand also that because we're at the, um, at the terminal point, uh, we can see that, you know, this scene may be more of an appearance for Christ in judgment, but at least uh, you can see the correlations between the Exodus, the events that transpire, as well as at uh, Revelation chapter 4. Now, in Psalm 68, 15 through 18, a mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan, a mountain of many peaks in the mountain of Bashan. Why do you fume with envy, you mountains of many peaks? This is the mountain which God desires to dwell in. Yes, the Lord will dwell in it forever. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. You have ascended on high. You have led captivity captive. You have received gifts among men, even from the rebellious, that the Lord God might dwell there. So the text shows that the ascension on Pentecost was an ascension to Mount Zion. Uh, compare Ephesians 4 and verse 8. Uh, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, gave gifts to men. The foundation was laid in Zion, Isaiah 28, 16, 1 Peter 2, 6, Hebrews 12, 22 and 23 in Revelation 14, 1, because you have uh, them standing on Mount Zion. And then the deliverer will come out of Zion, uh, Romans 11, 26, and Isaiah 59 and verse 20. So what you have here are feast days and the temple. The backdrop for all of the scenes in Revelation is the temple. In Exodus 23, 14 through 20, they observe the feast days, uh, or notice that the observance of the feast days were moved to a permanent place. As the Bible says, three times a year, all the males shall appear before the Lord God in the place where he chooses. Deuteronomy 16, 16, uh, also 34, 23 through 24. And so what feasts? It was Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Therefore, all the feasts mentioned in Revelation occur in the temple, that is, before the face of God. That's uh, the correlation that we were showing with this backdrop of the temple. And you can see that because over and over again, uh, you see the throne mentioned in the book of Revelation. And we pointed out that the throne was um, in the temple, uh, in the most holy place. It was over the, uh, it was above the two cherubim um, that was in the most holy place. And so all of the feasts mentioned in Revelation occur in the temple before the face of God. Now, the significance of the temple in Mount Zion, this shows that the typology of Revelation is focused upon and addressed to those familiar with the temple culting. To no other generation following that of Christ would understanding the temple cultic or feast days be as relevant and critical to their daily lives and religious experience. Jesus in the Gospels and the apostles in the epistles had already spoken of a new messianic temple that would immediately follow it and render the first temple obsolete. Jesus spoke of it in John 2, 19 through 21 or 22, when he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. In John 4, 20 through 24, when he talks about uh, you would neither worship God in this mountain nor even in Jerusalem, but that they would worship God in spirit and in truth is a reference to the new tabernacle of God, to the new temple of God. In 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, he refers to the church as 
the temple of the living God. Same thing in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. And in Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, uh, they are being built up on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole uh, family of God grows together as an habitation of God through the Spirit. And then 1 Peter 2, verses 4 uh, through 6, he talks about there being them being a spiritual house built up to offer spiritual sacrifices to, uh, to God. And so uh, all of those references demonstrate that the temple was already in progress and that we are seeing in the book of Revelation the culmination of the temple uh, in that particular book. And that's a critical juncture in the life of the first century saints. So all of this temple uh, culture, all of this festal culture is right there in the New Testament in the already but not yet, again, demonstrating that the people who would have the greatest understanding knowledge, application, and experience for the um, feast days and for the temple itself would have been those who lived in the time that the temple existed, and that would mean first century saints, and that's a strong argument for the application of the events in the book of Revelation since they are set within that background uh, that it was written in the first century before the temple was destroyed. Now, in summary, we have shown that the feast days are symbolized in Revelation. The summer festivals were inaugural in that they introduced the decisive end times event typified in the Old Covenant. The Passover is referenced because it had an inaugural, progressive, and consummated focus. It could not be viewed as holy past, as Bacciochi claimed. The combination of the Passover theme and judgment, that is the Feast of Tabernacles, as we've seen in Revelation 7, uh, 9 through 17 is therefore a natural one, since the Passover would not be fulfilled until Christ drank it new in the kingdom of God. The epistles show clearly that the Feast of Unleavened Bread is inseparably related to the Passover and therefore was in progress during the apostolic era as an inaugural and present event, 1 Corinthians 5, 7 through 9. Revelation spoke of Christ as the beginning of the creation of God, uh, which is an ellipsis of its use in Colossians, which connects it to Christ being the firstborn or the firstfruits from the dead. And you can even find references to that in Revelation as well. And finally, the heavenly scene of Revelation 4 alludes directly to the Exodus, at which time the law was given, and therefore is an allusion to the day of Pentecost. That's not to say that um, uh, it is the beginning, but remember, uh, the revelation of God was progressively given and therefore, even at the time of the writing of the book of Revelation, more revelation that belonged to the revelation that began on Pentecost was yet being given. So just because it's there doesn't mean that it cannot re refer to the events of Pentecost in the sense that uh, it represents the time when the outpouring of the Spirit is still in progress and therefore uh, this new law is being given. And thus Christ makes his appearance as the divine son of God who sits upon the throne ready to disclose the revelation of God and the judgments in the book of Revelation.